We've always been a dual-income family, and Mom was always career-focused. David once told me. I had taken his word for it, assuming his mom, my mother-in-law, was not that interested in family matters. My name is Mary. I'm 42 and work part-time. Eight years ago, I married David, who is four years older than me. Unfortunately, we haven't been blessed with children. As David said, his mom was a career woman. She's the complete opposite of me. She decides and acts quickly. I'm the type who's often described as laid back, and I've always admired how efficiently she operates. At first, I thought she might be intimidating, but once we talked, I realized she might be tough in speech, but she's caring and always makes sound judgment. I've come to love her. My own mom passed away, so mother-in-law has always been my go-to person for advice. But David isn't fond of his strict mom and often clashes with her. Apparently, this has been a long-standing issue. He holds grudges about things she said or did that he didn't like. Listening to both sides, I believe mother-in-law is doing nothing wrong, but David seems to think as the eldest son, he should get special treatment. Yet mother-in-law treats David and his sister Betty the same way. She's fair to everyone. Betty appears to adore mother-in-law, so I think David is just being difficult. Two years ago, mother-in-law retired. That year, my father-in-law passed away, and she seemed to lose her zest for life all at once. I want to travel with my husband after I retire, she used to say. That dream never came true. Our life started to change dramatically after that. Something's off with mom lately. David mentioned, When I visited my in-laws, even I noticed that mother-in-law was not her usual self. She had started forgetting recent conversations and where she had placed things. A sense of dread crossed my mind. Still, David showed no compassion for his mom. Do you think she has dementia? Well, if that's the case, let's just put her in a facility. She had a job. She'll have money for it. He coldly said, I couldn't hold back my anger. She's your mother. Can't you be more considerate? But David just scoffed. You're practically brainwashed by mom. David doesn't seem to like how fond I am of my mother-in-law. Why don't you marry? Take care of it then. His words left me feeling hopeless. So I reach out to my sister-in-law, Betty. Betty is a busy mom of two. Her eldest is in college, and her youngest is in middle school. She also works part-time. I don't contact her often because I know she's swamped, but she's someone I can rely on. As soon as I reach out to Betty, she offers to take my mother-in-law to the hospital right away. Don't worry about leaving it all to me. I'll handle it from here. She says this, but I'm worried about my mother-in-law too, so I decided to go to the hospital with her. After multiple visits and tests, my mother-in-law gets diagnosed with dementia. They say it's probably because she retired and that her lifestyle changed dramatically, especially after the loss of my father-in-law. She needs a significant level of care. We all gather to talk about it, including David and Betty's husband. Surprisingly, David steps up. Why don't we move in together and take care of mom? Betty has her hands full with the kids. We already live near my in-laws, so our life wouldn't change much if we moved in. In contrast, Betty's family would have to change school districts, which would be a big deal. So, I prepare myself for caregiving. We now live together with my in-laws. My mother-in-law seems less energetic than before, but when I take her outside, her eyes light up, 
and she becomes more like her old self. She loves the outdoors, so it seems to lift her spirit. Thankfully, her dementia hasn't progressed much. On David's day off, I suggest going for a walk together. I'm tired from work. Why bother? The weather's nice. Why don't you go to the spa or something? David had said he would help, but in reality, I'm the one doing all the caregiving. What does he think he's doing? Still, the idea of going to the beach is a good one. I'll look for a place we can visit for the day. When I tell my mother-in-law, she's thrilled, so we drive to a nearby spa. We enjoy the spa and a meal, but when we get back, David is nowhere to be found. He didn't say anything about going anywhere. I call him concerned, but he doesn't answer. Instead, I get a text message. He says he'll be late because he's out drinking with friends. I had a bad feeling. Growing impatient with David's late return, I was about to go to bed when I heard a car pull up outside. Carefully peeking out of the upstairs window, I saw David getting out of an unfamiliar car. Quickly, I captured the moment with my phone's camera. It was too far to see clearly, but it seems like a woman was in the driver's seat. I couldn't really tell what was going on, but from that day, I decided to keep a close eye on David's activities. Three months had passed since then. My mother-in-law's condition seemed a bit better than before. The doctor suggested that taking her outside and brain exercises might be helping her. Yet they stressed that we needed to keep it up, as she wouldn't completely recover. Things had changed a bit since then. I started teaching her a bit of piano, and she began attending day services. She even made some new friends of her age, which seemed to be a good influence on her. Actually, when I first proposed the idea of her attending day services, David said something unbelievable. He was the one initially talking about putting her in a facility, but when it came to using day services, he said, That will reduce our inheritance. Why can't you just take care of her at home, Mary? David strongly opposed the idea, calling it a waste of money, but Betty retorted, Well then, David, why don't you take care of Mom for a day? Give Mary a break. We finally managed to get her into day services. Betty not only comes to pick up my mother-in-law for her hospital visits, but also visits us with her kids. She even brings gifts and meals for me. I'd love to have her energy. She's truly her mother's daughter. While my mother-in-law and Betty have a great relationship, David seems to be bothered by it. Lately, he's been coming home late and even working on weekends. I tried to engage him in conversation about our day and ask him about his work to make him feel included at home. Despite this, he said condescendingly, You wouldn't understand if I talked about work, right, Mary? So, what am I supposed to do then? However, one day, my concern suddenly became irrelevant. What's with the luggage? Seeing David with a suitcase as he was about to leave in the morning, I couldn't help but ask. Oh, I've got a business trip starting tonight. Last through the weekend. Got told out of the blue yesterday. It's really a hassle. With those words, what could I do but agree? Still, even as David says he's annoyed, he seems somewhat fidgety and happy. How far are you going? Oh, where was it again? I was just told yesterday. I have to head to the office. David avoids my eyes as he speaks. All right, take care then. I rush David out the door as we're running out of time and close the front door. Just as I start feeling suspicious, my mother-in-law calls out to me. Good morning, Mary. About this... Wait, isn't this from the day spa we went to together? What mother-in-law is holding is a partially cut-out flyer from that spa. 
I think it's something we both received and then discarded because we didn't need it. Upon closer look, it's a clit's coupon. Mother-in-law and I exchange glances. Mother-in-law goes back to her room and shows me her diary. Ever since being diagnosed with dementia, she says she started keeping a journal. In it, there are entries that express suspicions about David's infidelity. Mother-in-law apologizes to me. I'm sorry for not saying anything. I couldn't tell whether what's written here is true. And before I knew it, it's come to this. I'm at a loss for words for a moment. The next words that come out are simply, I see. Mother-in-law's face looks like she's about to cry. That's when I put on a smile. Thank you. Now I can be sure. Mother-in-law's expression changes completely. I tell her that I, too, had suspicions about David's fidelity, but couldn't bring it up for fear of making her sad. Today, mother-in-law seems to be in good spirits, almost as if she doesn't suffer from dementia. I'm now certain about David's infidelity, but want proper evidence. When mother-in-law asks what I want to do, I am able to clearly say that I want a divorce. Upon hearing this, mother-in-law starts making a phone call. About an hour later, the doorbell rings. The person who comes in is a former colleague of mother-in-law. It turns out mother-in-law used to work at a law firm, and this person is a lawyer specializing in divorce cases. She never thought that she'd be helping to sue her own son. I spoke with a lawyer to figure out what steps to take next. Just as we were discussing this, the doorbell rings again. It's Betty who walks in. I'm so sorry for my good-for-nothing brother. I was surprised by Betty's deep apology, but it was comforting to know she was on my side. The next day, my mother-in-law and I head to the spa in Betty's car. There, we see the car that has dropped David off at our house several times. And then we spot David with a woman. I took photos with my camera and noticed something shocking. The woman was holding a small boy. My heart was pounding. I had previously found a child's toy in David's bag. When I asked, he said he might have gotten it while dining out with a colleague's family, and that he would return it. At the time, I took his word for it, but now I wonder if the toy belonged to this child. We gathered the evidence and went back home. I decide to go through with the divorce and set the plan in motion. First, I call the moving company. I consulted with you yesterday. Can we move out immediately? The company checks and says, Yes, we can. My mother-in-law and I quickly pack our essentials and I call another service. Within an hour, the movers arrive and quickly load up our belongings. We leave our stuff at Betty's place, and she helps us rent a monthly apartment. Betty's husband works in real estate, so he found us a place quickly. I still have one more thing to take care of. As the movers leave, another service arrives. Is it okay to change the locks? Yes. My mother and I nod, and the work begins. Now David can't enter this house anymore. Since the person is under my mother-in-law's name, we don't need David's permission for anything. The next morning, I head to the detective's office early. As unbelievable as it may seem, I have to confirm this. If there's a secret child, the investigation will reveal it. I believe a wife has the right to know about her husband's situation, and so I reviewed the investigation result. Of course, just as I suspected. I was shocked. My husband David had a secret child. The child I saw yesterday must be David's. Cheating on me, having a child, and secretly acknowledging paternity? That's despicable.
I'm done having feelings for David. I'm going to get him back good. That night, I received a call from David. Hey, I can't unlock the door. What's going on? Open the door, will ya? What? I changed the locks, so obviously your keys won't work. You changed the locks? Why? You don't live here anymore. Also, we've moved. What? David's voice was panicky. I couldn't help but smile, imagining his confused face. You leave your dementia-stricken mother with your wife and cheat on her? Even have a kid? Then lie about going on a business trip when you're actually at a spa? And choose a hotel that your wife and mother have stayed at? What's wrong with you? Did you see a coupon for it at home? Using coupons that your wife saved to take your mistress on a trip? That's unthinkable. David was trying to say something, but he was too flustered to speak. You really thought I had no clue, huh? You should have divorced me when you had the kid. Oh, but I guess you can't because then you'd have to deal with your mom's care. Finally, David managed to utter some words. No, that's not it. His predictable response made me want to burst out laughing. At that point, my sister-in-law Betty, who was standing next to me, couldn't hold back and shouted, then explain what's different. David was surprised to hear Betty's voice. I pretended to be clueless and said, Oh, I have you on speakerphone, so everyone can hear this conversation. Betty, my mother-in-law, and even my lawyer were present. What are you doing? I haven't done anything. This is all a misunderstanding. I've never yelled at David before but I couldn't help but raise my voice this time. This is no misunderstanding, don't you get it? You're insulting not just me, but your mistress and even your own child. Do you plan on calling that child a mistake? David went silent. I'm getting a divorce. Do what you want after that. Wait, hold on. That's going to be problematic. What do you mean problematic? I'm the one who's in a bind here. Because the thing about mom is... Mother-in-law shouted. You think you can just dump your own mother's care onto your divorced wife? Apologize to Mary right now and show some sincerity. Don't worry, I won't rely on you or your mistress. Instead, you can kiss your inheritance goodbye. David falls silent. I finally speak up. I've known about your affair for a while, but I couldn't bring it up because of mother-in-law. With her and sister-in-law's support, I've decided to divorce you. You turned out to be a terrible husband, but I'm grateful I got to be with the best mother-in-law and sister-in-law. Hanging up, mother-in-law breaks into tears. Days later, David and I officially divorce. We seek damages from David and his mistress through our lawyer. David has become uncomfortable at his job since we sent the documents there, but he can't quit because he needs to provide child support and living expenses. Thanks to his unwarranted actions, the alimony increased significantly, and I was able to secure a considerable amount. Mother-in-law decides to gift us assets while she's still alive as an apology for the trouble she caused instructing Betty to use the rest for hospital and care facility fees. Betty's eldest son has gotten a job and moved out, so mother-in-law is living with Betty. I've bought an apartment nearby and continue to maintain a good relationship with mother-in-law and Betty's family. And at mother-in-law's suggestion, I've become a certified music therapist providing piano performances, and guidance at day services, leading a fulfilling life.